good morning to you all. It's good to be here. I want to say publicly uh, thank you to Dr. Moeller for this kind invitation. Uh, I highly respect this institution and what the Lord is doing here at Southern Seminary. Uh, I want to also just acknowledge again my beautiful wife, Athena. This is her first time here to the campus, and I was telling her on the way up here how beautiful uh, this campus is. Uh, just a joy to be with you all this morning. Good to see uh, Dr. Kevin Smith. He is a son of Main Street, so we claim him. Amen. And Minister Joseph Dix, who serves with me at Main Street Baptist Church, and, and all the other dear brothers, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, without further ado, let us bow in a word of prayer and dive into the text this morning. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege that we have to hear your word. The word of God is the voice of God in written form. We ask, Lord, that you would indeed incline our hearts to your testimonies, that we would see your glory in it and be changed from one level of glory to the next. Thank you for this seminary and what you are doing, Lord. Pray for these students that you will use them in their preparation for ministry and continue to strengthen the faculty and staff to be an example of Christ. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, on the Merv Griffin Show, the guest on the show was a bodybuilder. And during the interview, Merv asked the question, why do you develop those particular muscles? At that point, the bodybuilder stood and began to flex a series of well-defined muscles from chest to calf. The audience applauded. Merv asked the question, what do you use those particular muscles for? The bodybuilder stood up again and began to show forth his huge muscular biceps and triceps, but he didn't answer the question. But Merv was persistent. He says, why do you use those particular muscles? What are they used for? The bodybuilder was bewildered. He had no answer but to simply display his muscles. If I was to ask you a question this morning, what is the purpose of pursuing a theological education? What would your answer be? What is the purpose of all the research, the studying, the lectures, all the assignments and all that you're doing in preparation for, for ministry? With all the insight and knowledge that you are achieving here at Southern Seminary, how is that benefiting your walk with Christ? If I was to ask you to show a series of characteristics of where you are in your walk with Jesus, will this theological education you're receiving from Southern be a part or a reason for why you're growing and developing as a believer? Am I making sense this morning? These are important questions for all of us to consider. So in order to help you to discern if your theological muscles are actually shaping your character to be more like Christ, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to title this message this morning, Seven Marks of Christian Maturity. And as you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, our focus this morning will be verses 5 through 11. Uh, but in order to give you the flow of the text, uh, let me give you just a brief outline so you can follow as we go along. In verses 1 through 4, we have the possession of spiritual life. In verses 5 and 7, we have the pursuit of spiritual growth. And in verses 8 and 11, we have the peril of spiritual neglect. Verse 1, we have the possession of spiritual life from verse 1 to verse 4. I'm reading from the New American Standard 
translation. Verse 1, Peter writes, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Simon Peter's last epistle to these believers who are scattered throughout Asia Minor. In his first letter to them, as we read earlier, Kyle read earlier, he is writing to these believers to encourage them to stand firm in the grace of God in the midst of suffering. In this second letter, which is his last letter, written a year or so before his death, Peter wants to remind these believers of the importance of growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that's possible because we see in verse 1, Peter says that we receive a faith of the same value or quality as the apostles. That the apostle Peter is saying here that, that as a leader in the church, the means by which you can grow in your walk with Jesus is no different than the means that I had to take in my walk with Christ. You and I have the same precious faith given as a gift at the moment of salvation. That's good news. In other words, in our reliance upon the Lord for salvation and the means of sanctification, the Lord didn't just give a double portion to the apostles and gave a little bit to ordinary Christians. Uh, there is no distinction. The same quality of faith that Peter and Paul exercise, it's the same faith that we have that equips us with the same ability, with that faith, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, Male or female, we are all one in Christ. And this gift of faith is given, as you see at the bottom of verse 1, it is given by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter makes it clear that Jesus Christ is God. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is Peter's prayer wish that multiplied grace and peace will be experienced in your life as a result of the believer being committed in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Knowledge there dealing with the gospel. And it's a relational knowledge that Peter is praying. My, my prayer wish is that multiplied unmerited favor and multiplied inner tranquility will be experienced in your life. Not just you be aware of this grace and peace from a theological perspective, but as, you in the, as you're in the Word of God, you're reading the Word of God, you're studying the Word of God, and you're applying the Word of God, I pray that grace and peace, the multiplicity of grace and peace, will be experienced in your life in all situations and circumstances. That's good news, amen? Now the question is, how can Peter's prayer become a reality? Notice in verse 3, he begins seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own excellence, glory, and excellence. Now, in the King James translation, it begins, according as. In the ESV, it begins his divine power. The reason why there's a difference, particularly with the ESV and the NIV, is that most translators believe that Peter is transitioning here from his salutation in verses 1 to 2 to the body of this letter. But I believe the King James and the New American Standard has it correct, uh, that, that Peter has not yet transitioned to the body of the letter. He is still staying the course of the salutation. And we can understand verses 2 and 3 in this way. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. It's only right, Peter says, that I feel this way about you, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. This prayer is, can become a reality in your life in light of the fact 
of what Jesus Christ and his divine power has granted to you at the moment of faith up until this present time, everything that you need for life and godliness. Verse 3, through the true knowledge of him, the him referring to Jesus Christ, true knowledge again refers to the gospel. Called is the effectual call of God. The moment you heard the gospel, the Spirit of God drew you to himself and enabled you to exercise faith in Christ Jesus. And the means by which you were compelled by that calling is that you saw in the gospel the glory of Christ, his deity, and the excellence of Christ, his glorious humanity. Look at verse 4. For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. For by these, these, these referring to his glory and his excellence, he has granted to us at the moment of faith, up until this present time, his precious and magnificent promises. So Jesus has called us unto salvation, we were compelled to believe, seeing the glory of his deity and the excellence of his virtue and his humanity. And as a result of the gospel, we have these magnificent and precious promises that God the Father has granted through his Son these precious and magnificent promises by which we participate in his divine nature. Glorious thought. Let me put it this way. Because partakers of the divine nature is referring to the very life of God and dwelling the soul of the believer by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit communicates to us the redemptive achievements of Christ by his indwelling in us. So all the precious and magnificent promises that have been granted and achieved through the cross, has been communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. We are partakers of the divine nature. Am I making sense this morning? The very life of God indwells us. It's possible to have grace and peace multiplied in your life because you have God, a very God, dwelling within you. We have the possession of spiritual life. Now we transition Verses 5 and 7, in light of that, the pursuit of spiritual growth. Verse 5 through 7, now for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness, love. In verse 5 Paul, Peter writes, for this very reason, in light of receiving everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness and being partakers of the divine nature, there's a part now that we must play. God has given us everything we need. Now we have to live it out. I think it was John Bunyan that said that the soul of religion is the practical part. That biblical Christianity is not just an accumulation of information. It's a changed life. It's a life of obedience. And, Paul, and Peter says, for this reason, applying all diligence. In other words, it takes focus. It takes effort of mind, will, and emotion to grow in light of everything that God has given us in salvation. It's similar to what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. Now the question is, in this pursuit of spiritual growth, what do we need to do? What is our responsibility? Well, most commentators believe that faith is an added virtue here that you must add in order that you might grow, thus making eight characteristics as opposed to seven. But I don't believe that Peter is saying to us that we need to add faith in order to grow because in verse 1 he says we already have faith of the same precious value as the apostles. You have faith already because you're born again. Now you must add 
to that faith the same means that the apostles use for their spiritual growth. Oftentimes we think that those who we look up to, spiritually speaking, the super apostles or the super preachers, they must have just extra anointing by God to do the things that they're doing. And Peter says, when it comes to spiritual maturity, we all have the same path to go down. I have to apply myself the same way you have to apply yourself. There is no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. Now, before we look at the seven marks of Christian maturity, I want you to understand that these are all interconnected. That as each virtue is mentioned, it relates to the other virtue. And as you see how it relates to one another, you can discern whether these seven characteristics of Christian maturity are in your life as well. Notice here in verse 5, in your faith, supply moral excellence. The word supply or add or provide was a word that was used in secular Greek world to speak of a director. Adding or supplying and paying the expenses for those who are in a play. In other words, the director would simply give his financial contribution along with the state in order to help the actors and pay for their needs after a performance. In this context here, Peter says, now that you have faith, you have to add or supply that faith. You need to, you need to contribute what God has already given you to moral excellence. Uh, moral excellence, according to Greek philosophers, means the fulfillment of a thing. In other words, Greek philosophers believe that when something fulfills its purpose by nature, it's moral excellence or virtue. Uh, moral excellence for us would simply mean that the believer's highest aspirations is to live a righteous life that accords with the purpose of being saved in the first place, and that is Christ-likeness. Amen? So Peter says, add to your faith, Moral excellence. If you're aspiring to be like Christ, then it will lead you to the next virtue, knowledge. Knowledge is, as we saw in verse 2 and 3, the gospel. I will call gospel indicatives. I want to fulfill my purpose from why God has saved me, therefore it demands that I get some knowledge. And as I get the knowledge, as, I in the, as, I, as I'm in the word of God, and I see the person and work of Jesus Christ through the gospel and its implications, then that will drive me and help me in this direction of pursuing moral excellence. Is that making sense? Apply to your faith, moral excellence, highest aspiration to be like Christ that comes by knowledge. And when you got the knowledge, add self-control. Self-control literally means holding oneself in. Self-restraint. Self-discipline. It means that we need to bridle or to be diligent in watching over our hearts. Now, this fits perfectly with knowledge because it's not just information I'm receiving. I can know whether I am achieving my desire for moral excellence by getting in the knowledge of God's Word if it leads to self-control. If it doesn't lead to self-control, I'm merely a hearer of the Word and not a doer. So as I, as I get, so the, the, the gospel indicatives of the knowledge leads to gospel imperatives to apply what I'm, grow, I'm learning in my Christian walk. And once you get self-control, it leads to perseverance. Uh, perseverance means steadfast endurance under the weight of difficulty. I believe this fits perfectly, as Peter writes this by divine inspiration, with self-control. If I'm growing in the Word of God, I'm applying God's Word, I'm exercising self-control, that means when life gets difficult, I will persevere. Perseverance means that I do not give in to temptation nor give up in trials. And once you've supplied perseverance, add godliness. And then I didn't mention this, but the command to supply or add is assumed after each virtue. Apply godliness. Godliness means 
reverence towards God. You can translate it true worship. Godliness means I fear the Lord. And this fits, this fits perfectly with perseverance because it explains why I don't give in to temptation nor give up in trials because I fear the Lord. Godliness means I'm going to honor the Lord in this situation no matter what happens to me. And then when you've had godliness, add brotherly kindness. From this word, we get the word Philadelphia. It deals with godly affections towards brothers and sisters in Christ. This fits well with godliness, brotherly kindness. Because if I'm not properly related to the Lord, then I cannot properly respond to others in brotherly kindness. And then when you add brotherly kindness, love. Agape love. So brotherly kindness is an affection towards brothers and sisters in Christ because we have the same identity of being in the family of God. And this love now describes how I'm to demonstrate that affection towards you. I ought to love you so much, I want to die to myself in order to express my love towards you. Are you tracking with me, brothers and sisters? Now, it's interesting here that, that brotherly kindness and love will be built upon godliness. Because typically when we think about how we're doing spiritually, uh, we focus on our personal devotional life. I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm consistent in my prayer life and my Bible reading. I, 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 I'm, I'm doing well and all that that I know is expected of me to grow in my walk with the Lord. But Peter's saying this, you cannot really discern how you're doing in the area of sanctification if you're not involved in other people's lives. Sanctification is the fulfillment of two of the greatest commandments, loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving my neighbor as myself. Or to help you this way, I think we've missed this when we see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. When Paul says, therefore, I beseech you, I urge you as a prisoner of the Lord to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. In light of the gospel that you've understood, all the riches that we have in Christ, your life ought to balance out or be equal to the riches that we have in the gospel. That's what worthy means. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then in verse 2, Peter describes what that worthy walk looks like. With all humility, gentleness with patience, showing forbearance towards one another in love. In other words, Paul is saying that the Christian walk is a corporate walk, not an individual walk. It is possible to grow in the knowledge of God's word apart from the church, but it's impossible to grow into Christ's likeness apart from the church. Am I making sense? You cannot say that you're doing well in your walk with the Lord if you isolate yourself from the life of the church. And yet it is sad to say that it's possible to love good theology and good preaching and be indifferent to faithful church attendance. I know I'm right about that. I know I'm right about that. I've seen it. And, 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 and and Paul is saying, listen, it, it's a corporate walk, not an individual walk. You, you, cannot be, you cannot grow in patience by yourself because everything's going your way. <laughs> patience comes by being around redeemed sinners. Love comes by being by, around redeemed sinners. Gentleness comes about by being around redeemed sinners. These are social virtues. As one preacher says, fellowship does not create problems, it merely exposes them. It shows where we're lacking in Christian maturity. We can't live out what we don't know. So these are the seven marks of Christian maturity. We're to pursue these in order to discern if we're growing as we should be health-wise. Now we transition to the last part of our study, The Peril of Spiritual Neglect. This takes us to verses 8 through 11. And in this section, quickly, I want to give you four dangers of failing to grow in Christian maturity. Verse 8, you'll be unproductive in Christian service. Verse 9, you'll be unsure of salvation. 
Verse 10, you'll be unprepared or unprotected against false teachers. And in verse 11, you'll be unprepared for the second coming. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they neither render you useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if these qualities, referring to verses 5 and 7, the seven qualities, I like this. He says, he says Peter says, if these are yours and increasing, I love that. He's not calling for us to be perfect. Uh, we're going to fall short in this pursuit of spiritual growth. But my only concern is, do we have them in order to increase in them? And he says, if we're increasing and growing, this render us neither useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we have this relational knowledge, we will not be useless nor unfruitful. That's, that's deep. What, what Peter is saying is this, if we're not applying and adding to our faith moral excellence and self-control and knowledge and so forth, if we're not actively pursuing that, we will be useless in our service to Jesus Christ and his church. Useless can be translated one who's out of work. When it's used in the New Testament, it is normally translated idle. Can you imagine why you are here growing and learning that you can already be useless in your preparation for ministry because you're not growing right? Spiritually unemployed? That you are no benefit to Christ or his church? Do you have any spiritual influence in your house, in your church, or in your job? Or are you useless? Do, do when people come to you, do they find your ministry useful or useless? Are y'all with me this morning? Let me, let me remind you of something. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness, that the man of God, the preacher, may be equipped, may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Typically, when we read that verse, we're focusing on the academic side of Scripture. We're focusing on exegesis and systematics that will help the preacher to be equipped for every good work, and rightly so. But we must not miss this, brothers and sisters, that in our training in the area of academics when it comes to Scripture, though it may equip us for every good work, it is not until we grow in Christian maturity that we're prepared for every good work. The chapter before in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, the context there is not just focused on exegesis, homiletics, and biblical preaching. The context in which 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 is focused on, it is focusing on the important correlation between rightly divided text and a rightly divided life. Because Paul is warning Timothy, if you're not rightly dividing the word, you're getting caught up in all inane conversation that spreads like gangrene. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. It's a safeguard against apostasy and disqualification from ministry. This I'm focusing on the explication of the text. i got to also look at the application of the text. The text got to study me too. Why? Because verse 21, after Paul says, listen, therefore, if a man cleanses himself from these things, what do you mean these things? Inane conversation and carnal theological debates. He'll be a vessel of honorable use, sanctified by the master, prepared for every good work. If you're not doing that, you will be useless to Christ as you serve. And not only that, verse 8, you'll be unfruitful, barren. Even when you're trying to serve, nothing is happening in your ministry. Can't help but to think of countless pastors who've yielded to the sin of adultery in their ministry and disqualified themselves, and yet they still try to serve, and their ministries are barren. I pray it not be 
with us? Is your life a detriment to other believers? That the longer you're around somebody, their lives become more deep. They go on the decline than the incline. You're not helping anybody spiritually. The longer they're around you, they got to go home and get prayed up because they, they got so much carnal stuff by being around you. Unfruitful. Unproductive in Christian service. The next peril is unsure of salvation. Verse 9, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgot his purification from his former sins. If these qualities, verses 5 through 7, are increased, if you're growing and striving in Christian maturity, you will not doubt your salvation. And the best way to translate it here, blind being short-sighted, or nearsighted is, is blind in the sense of being short-sighted or nearsighted. It doesn't mean blindness in the permanent sense. Spiritual blindness, that would speak of an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. But it means that, that you cannot, in light of the fact you're not growing properly in your Christian walk, when sin takes place in your life, you don't have a biblical basis to discern where you are as far as your spiritual condition. You're short-sighted. You, 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 you've missed and you've forgotten your purification from your sins. Here's a question I ask our youth and our young adult at our church. I ask them, first of all, are you saved? Typically, they say yes. Then my next question is, do you believe that the Bible describes the characteristics of a true believer? And they typically respond by saying yes. Then I ask them, well, describe to me what the characteristics of a believer is in the Bible, and they can't do that. And so my next question to them is, how do you know you're saved? If you're not growing, you are vulnerable to doubt. Warren Wisby says that it's not our profession of the faith that guarantees that we're saved. It's our progression in the faith that gives us that assurance. The third danger is that you be unprotected against false teachers. This takes us to verse 10. Therefore, brother, be all more diligent to make certain his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now, though we know Peter in chapter 2 begins to give a warning about false teachers, Peter saying, if you're not growing here in all these virtues that I've just articulated, you'll be vulnerable to false teachers because false teachers... They bring destructive heresies, and a destructive heresy is sensuality. So if I got issues as far as my growth and holiness, if there's sins I'm not laying aside, I'm vulnerable to being led astray by false doctrine. That's why Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, Pay attention to your life first and your doctrine, because when your life deviates, your doctrine will too. You're vulnerable to false teachers. And then notice in verse 10, he says, therefore you make your calling and election sure. That's interesting. Because we know in the order of salvation, election comes before faith. But Peter says, you can't even claim you are elect unless you know the effectual or the, the evidences of the effectual call of God on your life in salvation. You got to make your calling sure first by knowing the fruit of the effectual call of God and salvation before you can even claim to be an elect. And then lastly, verse 11, if we're not growing in these virtues, we'll be unprepared for the second coming. For in this way, the interest into the eternal kingdom of our God and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, the last chapter of this letter uh, Peter warns that there will be mockers who will come in the last days. And they will claim that God will not bring judgment because there has not been judgment since creation. And Peter reminds them of the flood and that God will judge the world in the future by fire. And therefore, that ought to sober us when it comes to living a godly life. And so he says this, if you do this, if you're adding these virtues, then, you, then the abundance of the joy of the kingdom will be supplied to you. What does that mean? We know that the kingdom is not something that is awarded to us, that is a gift. 
But Peter is simply saying, and I believe in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15, that there's a foundation that's been laid when God saved you. That's Christ. And whether you realize it or not, the life that you're living, Jesus deems that as a temple, an edifice of worship. There is a temple you're building with your life. The question is, what's the material that you're using? Is it gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, or stubble? And when we stand before the Lord, our works will be tested. And if your life has been built with the precious jewels of wood, hay, I mean gold, silver, and precious stones, these seven marks of Christian maturity, your work will remain. But if it's wood, hay, or stubble, your work will not remain. And therefore, you forfeit a double portion of joy when you get to heaven. You already have the joy of being called of God and saved. But you forfeit that double blessing because you wasted your life. So as I close, my question to you is, what is the purpose of pursuing a theological education here at Southern? With all the knowledge and insight that you are attaining, how is that developing your Christian character? If I was to ask you to show your theological muscles, would it resemble Jesus Christ? I pray that we, as God is raising up leaders here at this seminary, that we will not forfeit all the investment that has been poured into you by neglecting to grow in these seven marks. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. I pray, Lord, that this would be, by your spirit, a message that will cause all of us to soberly examine ourselves that we would no longer approach our studies merely as curriculum, but we would strive to draw near to you, Lord Jesus. Guard us, O oh God, from being spiritually unemployed and barren to you and to your church. In Jesus' name, amen.